I'm back, and I have a shit ton of poison ivy. It's the 4th of July. The sun's beaten down. I'm turning 20 in two days, and things are just swell. This is going to be the final episode of season two of the podcast, and I am quite proud of it, and I'm really happy with who I have for the last episode. But first, I'll I'll give some updates. Um, Like I said, I have a shit ton of poison ivy. I've been doing hella landscaping, and um, believe it or not, poison ivy is everywhere. But now I know what it looks like, so that's cool. Calamine lotion, I would say, is the best way to go. There's also a spray called Ivarest. But here, uh, here's some, here's a tip. The best way to prevent poison ivy actually is to clean after you've been in it. So it's not about, uh, it, it's not a lost cause if you come into contact with it. It's the oil that is on the poison ivy leaves, a name which I can't pronounce. Um, I recommend the coldest water you can stomach, some dish soap, and a rag, and just wipe it. Wipe it real good. Uh, it, it's similar to motor oil. So think of it that way when you're trying to get it off. So yeah, even though I know that, I'm, I've st- I have still have a shit ton of poison ivy. Um, It's been like a month or two since I published the last episode. I've been working so much and uh, playing a lot of tennis and writing a lot. And actually putting the podcast on YouTube, which has been a really cool endeavor. And uh, I'm nearing the end of that which is nice. Last night I went and saw Midsummer, Ari Aster's film, and it was really, really good. I, I recommend it for sure. Really trippy. Lots of um, lots of interesting character dynamics in it that you got to really pay attention to. And the music, again, was phenomenal. It wasn't Colin Stetson like for Hereditary, who I interviewed, by the way. I don't know if, uh, if you're listening to this, if you know that or not, but I did. Um, but it, not the same composer. I think his name is Bill something. I don't want to misname him. But the music was phenomenal. The sound editing was bananas in the theater. Lots of pans. Lots of lots of layering. And it was done really, really well. So I recommend Midsummer. Uh, I don't even know what I updated. I don't. I think I'd been to North Carolina and Tennessee since the last time I recorded an episode. So I'll just assume that I already, I've already said that. Uh, I'm going to see the Flaming Lips at the end of the month, and that'll be the the peak I think of summer. It'll be smack dab in the middle, or I guess we're already already halfway through. But I can't wait to see the Flaming Lips. I think this is number four, and they're playing with the Claypool Lennon Delirium, which is dope. Uh, I've never seen Les Claypool, and the man's a beast on the bass. Besides that, I've dyed my hair about four times. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of Bjork, so I'm that kid now. And I've been watching a lot of Hitchcock and Fellini, actually. And I finally got around to watching The Master, a uh, PTA's movie. And I, I really enjoyed it. Joaquin Phoenix is uh, quite the guy. Very interesting person. And um, speaking of PTA, Tom York's album Anima is fantastic as well, and the short film on Netflix is awesome, and I highly recommend you go see it. And while we're on the topic of Netflix, I will hop to my guests, guests, that's right, two guests today. Today is the first and possibly only double episode in the history of this podcast's history, yeah. So, today we have director Alex Lehman and composer Julian Wass. They created Paddleton on Netflix, starring Mark Duplass and Ray Romano. So, I'm geeked as hell, to be honest, to have been able to do this, because Paddleton was phenomenal, and Alex also made Blue Jay, and um, that also had Mark in it and Sarah Paulson, and Julian also did the music for that, and Julian also did the music for Creep, and Creep 2, I believe, um, with Mark, and they're just really, I, I just, the work that they're doing is the kind of work that I want to be doing, and I'm just really thankful to have been able to chat with people like that. And I think, I, I think the like-mindedness was an accurate um, estimation, uh, assumption as well. I think, I think we think in a lot of similar ways, which is exciting, because my dream is to work with the people that I've been interviewing and 
try to make something of myself and, and hopefully be able to collaborate. And even if not, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got to make what I would consider to be friends in this situation. So yeah, we have a double episode. It's going to be a, a big, fat one, so prepare for that. Uh, Paddleton, I cannot stress enough for you to watch. It's not very long, though it is heavy. Um, a lot of it's improvised, and I think Ray, Ray Romano especially is just... He, he, it doesn't seem that he's trying. And it, it's a very, very human movie, and you can feel you can feel the energy of both actors beyond just them trying to act. So yeah, things are good. It's been hot. It's rained a lot. Music's just as lovely as ever. Um, life's looking up. I think. I think. I've I've been in that state where I can't do too much thinking. I'm sort of just going, not going through the motions in a negative way, but I'm sort of just being, and I think I kind of go into, into that mode in summertime, where I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing as much. But I've been reading a lot, and I've beaten two Tony Hawk games, yeah, and I'm, I'm not, I think I'm sleeping enough. I'm getting like six to seven hours a night, and I'm still functioning, so that's good. So yeah, things are looking up. Um, I'm really proud of what I've done with this podcast so far, and I'm really excited for season three next year, which I'll start up in the fall. I might I might try to talk to somebody from Midsummer though, because that shit was awesome. So yeah, if you listen to this, or if you've listened to any other episodes, or you're still interested in the show, I appreciate it a lot. It, it means the world to me, because this is something that I'm very proud of. This is probably probably the most important thing that I've done. And all I've done is talk to people, but... I, I've made relationships and learned more about the dynamics of relationships in ways I hadn't before. Because when you try to make something of a stranger and have the stranger make something of you, it can be very special because it's a unique communication. So yeah, I will stop going on. Please listen to Julian Wass's music. He has a band as well. Uh, check out his scores. Check out any of the work he's done. And Alex Lehman also, again, Blue Jay. Paddleton, and he did a really cool documentary series that was just released on HBO called Asperger's R Us, and it's about a Asperger's comedy troupe, and it's a very, uh, it's a very good piece. I was trying to find the right word. It's I don't want to say moving because I don't want to be too dramatic, but it's it's very real, and it's very honest, and I appreciate that about it, and I appreciate that about my guests' visions. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed the season. I hope you enjoy your life. I hope summer's rocking and that you get to watch Paddleton. Here's my conversation with Alex Lehman and Julian Wass. Tell me a bit about your feelings about Paddleton and Asperger's RS now that they've been out for a minute. Um... Yeah, you know, they're, they're different, such different feelings, the two. Um, yeah, of course, of course. Take your time. Um, but, but yeah, I'd say that, uh, well, we can start with Paddleton. Um, For sure. You know, I've been very happy to, to see, you know, we've gotten good critical reviews, and it seems like a lot of people have watched it and have enjoyed it, um, and all that's wonderful. And then I really especially like how many people have connected to it on a personal level, you know, not just emotionally but people that feel like um either they've been the other guy they've you know they've had to you know by someone's side you know mm -hmm. and, and letting them go and because you know usually it's, it's not that person's story usually it's the story of the person who's dying right. so um I, I think a lot of people felt spoken to with that and then and then i think there's also a lot of people that are connecting to both of the characters just just Feeling like, um, you know, we're 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 showing. Oh, uh, we're, I'm sorry. Can I, hang on one second. I mean, I'm hmm. just blew in my garage. My cat's <laughs> trying to eat it now. Hey, nope, nope, nope. No, no worries. No, 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 no. Sorry. Hang on one second. I just burped. There we go. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so sorry, that never happened. Oh, would you um, say a bird? A bird, yeah. I'm in my 
I was just saying I, I agree entirely. I think it's strange that the, the the social like view on strange people, I guess. And and obviously I think that's the most important thing that film can do is is give give light to stories that aren't often told because in a way film like like his film is very pretty and though a lot of this was improvised, a lot of it can be written in a way that sounds you know, very easy to watch at times and not, not to say Paddleton was because it was very difficult, but it, it creates an avenue for people to empathize, I think. And I think that that's sort of obvious when you're making a film, but I think that Paddleton did it really well. So I definitely understand what you're saying when you say that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I think probably that's a great segue to Asperger's or us, you know, this is my, my second project. Yes. Yeah. It's true, but you know, these are guys who. I mean, you know, they their, their diagnosis alone, the, the label that they've been given, I think ostracizes them from yeah. from a large part of the community. And then, um, who they are and what their comfort is with people also uh, tends to kind of. A lot of people don't understand them. Um, or, or don't don't understand people who have Asperger's and and uh, and and so those people with Asperger's are often written off because they don't fit into the normal social right. interactions and norms and and so I'm not being very eloquent, but I guess what I'm trying to say is there's, there's a lot of people we're not very patient. And we've probably become less patient in in trying to take people in and trying to understand people. So we're very we're very quick to write someone off as weird or different or just to say I don't get them. Um, and and oftentimes we miss we miss you know seeing the the real beauty in in someone or you know what what makes someone special because we're not willing to take the time to, to get them. Yeah. Um, we we want to consume everything in, in a comfortable way, uh, including people. So yeah, that's tough. If someone, does, if someone doesn't know how to do the handshakes, the, the, the eye contact, um, uh, you know, the basic jokes that, you know, that we all, you know, that we all get, that, that, Basically, these are just forms of language mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if someone doesn't speak your language, you're not going to feel comfortable around them because it's a lot of extra effort to even try to understand them. And yeah. so, yeah, when someone with autism, Asperger's, um, or or whatever, you know, uh, race character had in Paddleton, um, you know, th th those, are, those are different languages. To, yeah. You know, those are strange languages to a lot of, uh, a lot of people. And um, 
and so we forget to connect with them. We forget to to just kind of decipher what it is that they're feeling and doing and who they are mm-hmm. by um, by just writing them off. Was, Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Was that difficult for you when you started filming with them a while ago? Like, did you feel yourself being like apprehensive or impatient because of how different they act or do you, or was it just a sort of natural reception to them? Um, I was really curious Mm -hmm. and I wanted to, I wanted to learn about them. I wanted to understand these guys that very quickly seemed different than a lot of people I knew. That reminded me of some people that, you know, maybe of some kids I went to high school with that I thought were weird when I was in high school that I didn't get because they had been presented to me as um, individuals with Asperger's. I knew to expect them to be a little different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and so I went in with an open mind and I, and I went in with patience and um, what I was rewarded with was getting to know really interesting people who were very funny and very, very, very human and very relatable, uh, extremely relatable. Um, I just had to kind of, you know, work through that initial barrier of they do and say and feel some things differently than I do. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, at first glance, it felt like very different, but it didn't take long to feel like, you know, we were actually really similar. Um, but I'm pretty patient I think um, when you know whenever I can be I'm pretty patient and I'm pretty curious and, and um, I, I like learning about people and things that are different than, than my own experience um, it feels a lot more rewarding than yeah. you know I would hate to be around another version of me <laughs> <laughs> God, that sounds boring. Um, you know, uh, uh, who are who seem strange and mysterious or confusing to me, or or just just who, who do or think differently than I do. That you know that 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 sparks a curiosity for me, and you know unless they're unless they're hurting me, or I guess after a while I'll get bored. Possibly, but but for a while, for a long while, I think I'm just going to be curious, and I'm just going to want to like appreciate uh, everything that's new to me. How has that allowed you to look at yourself differently? Like like you say, you wouldn't want to be around yourself, so so you feel pretty familiar with yourself. Do you think that like being around the Asperger's RS troop and the subsequent like feeling you get when you see others now, like the empathy maybe that comes from that? Do you, have you applied that to yourself? Like, do you see yourself as something that can be more, like you listen to yourself more or are you more empathetic inward, maybe? I don't know if that makes sense, but. Um, it, it makes sense. You know, I think. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> I, think I give a lot of, I give a lot of value to other people's perspectives and experiences. And I, and I recognize the fact that I'm, one perspective and I'm one experience Mm -hmm. you know I I I I think that I'm just trying to appreciate all the things that I'm not by by listening to other people and that that doesn't mean it doesn't mean that I want to be those people um right right and it doesn't mean that I'm that I'm going to agree with their opinions or you know that I'm going to try to be more like them um but, but it, I think it does keep me in check and it reminds me if I'm really open, if I truly am open to who someone else is. And so the first thing I'm doing is, um, I guess you know, the word judging gets thrown around a lot these days, but, uh, if I'm not just looking at what someone's doing or saying and thinking, that's not how I would do it. Or like, yeah. I, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. If I can take me out of the equation and as much as possible, just take them in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it, it probably 
kind of keeps me in check in my day to day life to remember that everything I'm doing is just my experience and every single person around me is having their experience so we all think we're right <laughs> we all we have, you know about whatever is going on and we all are experiencing a moment in our own shoes and we're not you know, taking in how other people are feeling and what other people are processing in the moment mm -hmm. um, and so to kind of remember yeah to kind of remember that like literally everybody is is feeling the me, 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 I'm, 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 um, in any moment, uh, it just, just kind of reminds me why, you know, mine is not special. I mean, mine <laughs> is mine and I should appreciate it, but, um, but I should understand how other people fit in to the moment and, and to my life and, and to the world. Yeah. I'm talking very philosophical here, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, if it makes sense, it makes sense. It does. I mean, I think it can be difficult because you, at the end of the day, still have to have something that you can look at yourself and be confident in your identity, I feel. Like, it, it gets tough if you give, like, I don't, I don't want to, I guess when you just take in information and you, like, really pay attention to people, especially bright people, really, really outgoing, like, people who are super complex and have a lot going on, it's, it's, a very healthy challenge to like myself to ask myself, well, what about me, you know, would make another person feel that like, that's interesting or like that, not that I would, that I would aim to be something that was interesting, but, but, it, but trying to find something that I'm comfortable with, like attributing to my identity. Cause there's just so many different perspectives. Cause when you, when you realize that everybody is like unique, you can very quickly like invalidate your opinions and invalidate like your experience. Not that, not like, I don't, I don't want to say invalidate, like, like it doesn't matter, but invalidate in the way that like, like everybody thinks they're right. Not everybody can be right, you know? So it just makes you question yourself a bit and that, that can be curious. I see what you're saying. You're saying that if, um, I think what you're saying is if you give enough room for other people's experience and, and opinions and feelings, you still have room for your own. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a balance there, for sure. Um, I would say that most people uh, are not on that side of the spectrum, <laughs> <laughs> of, uh, of the sympathy <laughs> spectrum. I think, I think most people um, tend to make it about themselves first, which makes sense, because they of course. are themselves. Um, so, <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, there's definitely, you know, codependencies. There's definitely people who, who you know, um, really do put everybody first and maybe, you know, are, are sacrificing themselves, you know, might, might have martyr complexes. Who knows? You know, I'm sure there's a whole range of people who go too far in that direction. Mm -hmm. I can't say I'm one of them, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I still... I think I've probably grown closer to center, but, but you know, when I wake up, I'm thinking about how and, 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 and what do I want? Right, we are and, selfish, naturally. Know, the default, the default, yeah, I don't think I'm selfish, but I think the default for most people is, you know, me first. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree, there's, there's, there's a balance to be had, like, and, and surely if you just make it about taking other people and you can forget to give yourself an equal voice. Yeah. So back to Paddleton a bit. Um, I read that it was sort of um, like a therapeutic experience for you to face death a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how did creating it, like, how do you... F did, did that exercise some, some fears or some questions or, or make you feel safer about anything relating to death? Well, I'm not afraid of dying personally. Yeah. At least no more than, than, than most people, at least. Um, I'm afraid of losing, um, I'm, you know, people I love. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I struggle to lose pets and struggle to lose friends. Um, I struggle with relationships ending um 
so it's more that but but um yeah yeah okay but uh you know I, when i said yeah i would say that more than anything this was this was an exercise for me to learn how to let go how to appreciate something and and let go of it while still validating it yeah letting it go um but i but the death thing was kind of more uh a little bit of a joke but it's because I <laughs> I mean I worked in a lot of horror uh, films I, de- I was a cinematographer in a lot of horror movies I yeah. do a lot of gory shit and, and, and dismemberment and blood everywhere and, <laughs> you know I got for a while desensitized to it and then all of a sudden it kind of like hit me in a different way very yeah. sensitive to it and I think in you know in movies now I have a lot of trouble being you know Violence. Like, like I certainly don't have any interest in seeing like a Saw movie or something like <laughs> that. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned to Mark uh, Duplass, you know, that I had just seen this movie that was like really disturbing. And this guy gets stabbed in the throat with a corkscrew, and it's just like gratuitous death and violence. I was like. I'm so glad that our we were just releasing our movie Blue Jays. Like I'm so glad our movie doesn't have any <laughs> violence or death in it. And so uh, you know, he was joking, but he was like, he's like, well then I guess you know your next movie, you know, you should you you gotta you gotta face that, you gotta face those fears. Yeah. So, just kind of kind of joke a little bit, but but uh, yeah, I don't plan on making movies anytime soon where there's like a, a murderer or a person <laughs> who's trying to physically harm someone. Or, or honestly, I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of like even everything I'm, you know, developing right now. There's no antagonist that's like a true, true form antagonist who's a bad guy, mm-hmm. um, who who just wants the money or who wants to kill someone or who wants the power. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm far more interested in telling stories where people are are in conflict because they have different wants or they think they have different wants but they're not like none of them are bad people you know you can rationalize each person's want as a a human need that is maybe misguided a little bit but you know I'm not I'm not exploring any characters like like Thanos or Hitler or (laughs) you know right I'm far more interested in and, and broken people trying to fix themselves or fix each other and, yeah you know try to make better sense of what it is that they want and how to get it in life for sure and, and accepting each other I think a lot of movies uh, that I'm working on right now too are about like learning you know characters learning about other characters understanding how why they're different and trying to appreciate that even if they don't totally agree and what does that do for you when you make movies like that? What does that do for you? Like, what do you feel once you've been able to create something that that exercises that kind of acceptance that you're trying to get down to? How do you feel after? Or even during, of course. Um, well, the best ones are, are, are when it's an exercise where even I have to accept a situation, you know, a conflict or, or a character. Mm-hmm. Um, that... I don't at least in the beginning I can't totally defend or rationalize yeah hopefully I'm like struggling to find the light in in people who are having a tough time and making some bad decisions so um, I guess how it makes me feel is it, it makes me feel connected to to more people by by really having to think about why I should like someone or root for someone or help someone that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think I had nearly as much appreciation for for people on the spectrum uh, before I started doing yeah. you know, the Asperger's Arrest documentaries. Um, if anything, I had a little bit of uh I think I laughed at the differences yeah. more than anything. You know, I mean, a Big Bang Theory is that's what 
that's what a lot of uh, people still make, you know, jokes about, you know, autistic people being mm-hmm. uh, a rain man or something, and and you kind of laugh at the differences. And it's not mean spirited, right. but it still is. But it still is, you know, it's just other kind of looking at how we're different mm-hmm. or what's you know, quote unquote, wrong with you, versus like, let me understand what we have in common and let me understand who you are and you know Mm -hmm. what what makes you tick so so I think all the storytelling for me is just trying to connect with you know people there's there's a there's a movie that I'm in development on right now and I didn't realize till very recently uh I mean it's about uh, the character's a guy and it's based on you know a memoir a real memoir and um He's like a real optimist, and he believes in like, you know, stuff like the secret and, and whatever. And I was like, you know, and, and like he's the villain in, in this story, but like we're really trying to, you know, find humanity in him, even yeah. though he's a little bit of a con man in some ways. But he's also just like a hopeful optimist. And I and I just I just realized like a couple of weeks ago, I was like, oh my god, like this is this is me facing issues about my mom. I love my mom, and we've got a good relationship, but like. You know, she's into, you know, uh, woo-woo and, um, <laughs> you know, believes in aliens and crystals and a lot of pseudoscience. And um, and it's very confusing and hard for me to accept that because I'm a more rational person. Yeah. And so I'm realizing, like, oh, my God, in a weird way, like, this movie is going to be an exercise in me trying to accept all the things about my mom that don't make sense to me. Um but I still love her and she's not hurting anybody <laughs> uh, you know that's so, very special like that is, it's, 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 it's yeah well I'm you know we're sugarcoating it right now there are days where I'm just like what is wrong with my mom she used to be a scientist and now you know she believes in blah 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 and like you know how, uh, how did that go <laughs> did she was she was there like a big switch or something yeah, there was a big switch for 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 her and my dad. But both my parents are scientists, you know, researchers, um, and neither of them work in the pharmaceutical industry anymore. Wow. And um, I mean, I you know, it it seems like maybe I don't want to say too much about them, but but like they you know, I I can kind of tell where and when it happened, and maybe why for both of them. Yeah. At a certain point in their lives, um, but it's confusing when you know you're a child, you're growing up. Uh, so you were you were younger then when I, it happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, you know, they, they basically, I, I think that I saw them both kind of uh, uh, go into different belief systems to a certain degree, mm-hmm. uh, especially my mother. Um, you know, after right after they got divorced, and um, and so that was towards the end of my high school years, and so growing up a child of two researchers, two scientists, all of a sudden I see, you know, these different beliefs and, and logic is no longer the, the the organizing principle. That's tough. You know, and, and um, you know, sci- I mean, logic to them, but, but like science and, and logic, the way it was presented to me, uh, those weren't the rules anymore. You know, they had, they, they were invested in different beliefs. And I I can understand why I can sympathize, but it's still very confusing. And and right. you know, there's there's time where I just I don't get these people anymore, and I want to get them. Yeah. And um, you know, it's very hard. It's like family members or parents or spouses. One thing that you love, there and you and you've known for a while, they're far more likely to to trigger things than you. Of course. Parents more than anything, because then you of course see all those things in yourself as well in one mm-hmm. way or another and you're comparing them to yourself in ways that you're not even aware of but uh you know I mean god if anybody could figure out how to make a father son movie I bet that could turn out alright <laughs> or uh anything Spielberg done um <laughs> you know it, 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 yeah I, I think I think that probably a lot of filmmaking for me is um, trying to understand people and things that I uh, don't understand yet. Um, this is going to sound cliche and probably like like a little um, 
uh, a cocky filmmaker. Go for it. I, I don't know, whatever. Like, I, I, I go mean for this it. very humbly when I say it, but it's probably like just like an annoying, you know, film school bumper sticker. I'll let you know. I don't like I don't like movies that go. I like stories that that go in knowing the answer. Like, if they have a message or an answer already, like. I, I they, they feel disingenuous to me and I agree um, and I think that the re- really good movies whether they're documentaries or narratives um, are created out of questions genuine questions that don't have an easy answer and that you don't have the answer to yet and so in the process of making the film you're going to be exploring the answer or the answers and um, that's that's to me where you know very very consuming exploration allows you to I don't know to discover you know discover, it's, it, it, you're, you're exploring ideas and you're, and you're discovering potential answers in the mm-hmm. thing and, and now you're, you're taking an audience on a journey of, of exploring all this stuff um, which I think they can tell I think an audience subconsciously can tell whether you're just pushing a message or, or taking them on the journey with you. I follow and that. To figure out like what the answer is. I, I can relate to that immensely because I'm, I'm right now in film school. So I'm, I'm not even in my like vein yet, you know, of what I want to create. I'm, I'm still going between documentary style and film style. So at this point I'm still making documentaries about me making documentaries because I want to know why I'm doing those things. So I'll, I'll record things, say like an airport, I'll go to an airport and just record people and flights taking off and, and patterns of like the way people act and businesses and the way people buy food and things like that. And while I'm doing that and trying to find my perspective, trying to record that perspective to, to relish in later, I have my friend recording me and asking me why I'm doing that, you know? So, so I, I, I'm still trying to find that genuine filmmaking. And I think, I think documentary is obviously very straightforward because you're just showing, you know, life. You're just, you're showing life. And so it gets very tough when things are scripted, even if a little bit, or things are planned because you, you always have to go into it realizing that it's like you're, you are aiming for something, even if it's a very, very, you know, rough draft. So I, I, I really relate to you when you say that the audiences can pick up on, on whether or not you're, you're experiencing what the, f- like when I watch a film, I like to be able to imagine the director also feeling when they make this, not just it being, you know, a political statement or something of the like. So I, I definitely understand that. Yeah, life is usually more complicated, um, and I don't, I don't, I don't really trust people too often when they say they've got the answers to everything. You don't. Um, you but, don't. Hey, Frank Capra says it better. Uh, so you know, take that for a bumper sticker. <laughs> he deserves. He deserves to be quoted. Um, <laughs> that's probably why I, I just babble and say things so uneloquently is because I don't deserve to be quoted. But Frank Capra, you know, one of the things was uh, if you want to send a message, try Western Union. <laughs> um, brilliant. I yeah, we don't we don't need movies for messages. I mean, you know, Hitler and Lenny Riefenstahl did okay, but you know, <laughs> that's uh, hey, that's my second Hitler reference in like <laughs> twenty five minutes. Me hey, about that. Let's aim for five, maybe. <laughs> See what we can we'll do. Call it a, just another Thursday. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like I like discovery, and whether it's a documentary or 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 movies. I don't know. I like, I like not going into the movie knowing all the answers. Yeah. Or having my opinions totally formed. So when you're making something like Paddleton and you're like at once like looking at your vision and trying to understand the story from your perspective, while you know Ray and Mark are improvising a lot and obviously putting themselves into their shoes because you can't not like. I guess I'm curious, like, what would, what would you do if you were either Michael or Andy? I mean, that's tough. Um, I think, 
you know, I, I, I want to say that I would have uh, the same thoughtfulness that Michael has in really not wanting to suffer, being aware of the fact that I am going to suffer. And the last X amount of time in my life could be very painful and unpleasant and there's no reason to go out like that. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a very mature, very aware uh, choice that that he's making. Um, But I would like to say that, that, that I would do that. Of course, I would also hold out hope that medicine or treatment or something would work. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, God forbid, I, I, I'd say I probably wouldn't have been able to make the decision as early as, yeah. as Michael had, but, um, but I probably wouldn't want to prolong my suffering and illness and, mm-hmm. and what other people would have to go through either. So, yeah, we'll, we'll say, uh, push it back a couple of weeks and, <laughs> less on Team Michael there, and then as far as Andy goes, yeah, I really relate to that guy who <laughs> doesn't want to see his his friend go and like is fighting to hang on. I you know, but uh, but, but I think that I'm probably I would be pretty good at putting in that situation, putting my friend's wants and feelings first, and yeah, uh, protecting him as much as my own wants are in direct conflict with that. Um, yeah. I mean, they're both great guys. <laughs> like, there's no bad guy in them. I love it. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's trying to hurt anybody. How great is that? Um, Cancer's the bad guy, I guess. I'm sorry? The, the terminal illness is the bad guy, you could say, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cancer sucks. Fuck cancer. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? What would you do in their positions? I don't know, man. I mean, I, I, I think it's beautiful that you can, like, like you were saying earlier, you can very quickly empathize with how they're acting without even asking yourself what you would do first. You know, like they just present it in such a human way that you're like, I get that. I, I absolutely understand why, you know, Michael's acting the way he is and why Andy, Andy has this struggle of, you know, feeling it's his his opportunity you know because like because that's tough there's no it's one of those it's one of those things where there's no right answer there's no obvious answer that smacks you in the face and like i i have a best friend who who i've known since i was like two and so like i love him dearly and i see him all the time and i like couldn't help but picture and he actually told me to watch the movie um and so watching it i just couldn't help but think of him and what i would do and it's just yeah. tough because a part of you is like, obviously, no, like you, you can't go, man. Like you gotta, you gotta try, but, but I completely accept wanting to, to end your time with dignity because that's, that's very special because I've had, I've had multiple grandparents with Alzheimer's who I've watched deteriorate, deteriorate into like nothing. And I'm like, sorry, yeah. I just don't, I wouldn't yeah. want that, you know, like I, when you get to the point that you're not you anymore, when you don't even have the option, I, I think that's really tough. So I can definitely understand wanting to go out with your friend, wanting to go out, you know, peacefully, even though, like Michael says, he's so scared, like, y- you got to know that that's, that's what he decided. So, and I, I think it'd be tough. I'm really bad at, like, holding on to things, I think. I think I have an issue with thinking like what ifs a lot and I've tried to reconcile that but I think if I was in any situation I'd have a really hard time doing that because you know you would just think well what if it was a month you know and things would have gotten better but I think you just gotta you just gotta take it very very present and I, and you would just have to accept you know like this is what happened and and there's no use in in what ifs because it's what happened and you can't you can't change it so I th- I would like to think that I would act similarly. I may be a little more erratic than Andy, <laughs> and less calm, but but I think I may act similarly in both in both situations for sure. Is that the thing about what Ray does in that movie? Is uh, 
and he's acting pretty calm, but you can feel the firestorm, the hurricane in yeah. this man's brain and body in every instant. It's the amazing. The struggle and conflict that this guy has. It's like, oh my God, how are you keeping it together? I know <laughs> that you're not, but how are you making it look like you're keeping it together? It's one of my favorite things about, about what Ray does, what he brings to the character. Yeah, and it's not fake either. Like, you don't feel like it's unrealistic because... That happens in movies where people are either too dramatic or they don't react enough. Like when somebody dies and they're like, oh, man. But like, I feel like he pinpoints it really well. Like that's how somebody would act because they don't know how to act. So it is it is this weird, quiet sort of mixture of like, like the scene where they're chasing each other with the chest the little, or the little bank. And it's like, yeah, I could see that because <laughs> it's tough. There's no right answer. An acting, acting teacher wants told me you know the way the way you act drunk is you know if you have to if you have to play drunk in a scene you don't act like you're drunk people when you're when people are drunk they're not trying to show how drunk they are right and maybe in college a little bit <laughs> other than that like people are they're actually trying to hold back how drunk you know like they're trying to sh- say like something literally people say like i'm not drunk you know i'm fine they're physically with their body and their actions and everything they are saying they're trying to show that they're not drunk. So it's, you know, to, to play drunk, usually is, it's better to be hiding your drunkenness than to be displaying your drunkenness. Um, that was a really good acting note that a teacher once gave me. Yeah, that's interesting. And, um, and so I like that what Ray is doing in this movie is he's, what we see that he's trying to stop himself from being the mess from being neurotic. He's, he's struggling not to be neurotic, which is who Ray Romano is, by the way. <laughs> he's, a, he's a neurotic guy who's trying not to be overly neurotic because <laughs> he's going to drive everybody crazy. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but yeah, he, he, he brought really wonderful stuff to that. But that, that extra layer, for any, for any young directors out there, yeah, or actors, like that extra layer of like, you know, think about how you know, human beings are constantly correcting themselves to to not be whatever it is that you know is embarrassing to be, whether it's drunk or mm-hmm. neurotic or you know an asshole. Uh, yeah. To give yourself that act, to give yourself that action uh, means that you're now playing a layered, more human character instead of just playing a caricature. That's like just an asshole nobody nobody goes around saying i yep yeah, i'm an asshole <laughs> go, like and, and meaning it you know right nobody goes around saying like i'm drunk i'm out of control people <laughs> are trying to keep control and <laughs> and so like adding that extra layer to your character makes them more human because that's what people do yeah for sure so when it comes to like his death do you do you think you would rather die Sorry, that's a bit much. <laughs> Do you think you would rather die, like, knowingly, like, Michael, or or would you prefer to just go out, like, like a light, just hit, hit by a bus, didn't know, didn't see it coming? Like, well, if you could pick, what do you think you'd want? Well, I'd want to be able to say goodbye to the people I love, for me and for them. Mm-hmm. So, probably I don't get to say goodbye to everybody I love and then get hit by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess that only leaves me with one option. <laughs> it's it's funny how much things seem to like I don't know. Like I I agree with you that I don't fear death much. Like that's not something that really I don't feel like a tightness in my chest or anything like like I'm very young so I'd rather not die right now, but mm-hmm. but like I'm not good. I'm not really afraid, you know, like if it happened, I think I'd be good. I think I'd be fine. <laughs> But you just got to realize, like, actually, what's funny is I was watching an interview with Keanu Reeves, and I think it was on uh, Stephen Colbert's show, and he just, uh-huh. and he was, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was interesting to me that he said that. What did he say? What's the question? Stephen Colbert just uh-huh. says, like, what happens after we die, Keanu Reeves, and Keanu just silently, he's just like, well, the people that love us will miss us. And it's like, yeah. that's, that's like the one constant about death, you know? 
Well, he's doing he's doing that thing that we were talking about earlier, which is taking into account uh, other people's experiences. Yeah. Um, it's so easy to make death about yourself. It's so, it's so easy to make anything that you're going through about yourself. Um, we often forget about how things impact other people. Yeah. And I guess, like you said, there's a balance. There's a balance to be had there for sure, but um, but it probably doesn't hurt most people to as an exercise. <laughs> So since you're rational, do you think when we die, we're just, that's it? Like what was what, the first part? Since what? Like, since you're very rational and logical, like you said, and you and you grew up with that scientific sort of, like, perspective, like, what do you think happens? You think that's just, we're just kaput? Um, I don't know. I just I don't know. I truly <laughs> don't know. It seems it seems rational. It seems possible. I'd say that I'm living for that. I'm I'm definitely not um, you know, putting any stock in you know afterlife will make up for anything shitty that happens in regular life. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy this ride as best <laughs> I can. Yeah. Assuming it's the only ride I get, and I feel extremely thankful for for it and for the consciousness I have during this ride and at the same time you know there's there's no science or rational logic that can explain why we're even aware of ourselves right and 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 and, and you know the, the big question the really big questions there's no answers to it. so I'm uh, I'm not gonna write anything off <laughs> that's I a good idea I don't want to be uh, reincarnated as um I don't know. Cancer? No amphibians. <laughs> no amphibians, maybe no reptiles. Yeah. I'd be like a bird or something. That'd be cool. Birds are great. Yeah. They're pretty cool. Hey, cat. I'm staring at my cat. He's just, you know. Just, I got to get a cat. I, mean, I think I'm going to get a cat this summer, actually. I've never had a cat. So. They're awesome. And they get they get the best life, man. They just <laughs> they sleep like, I don't like sleeping, but like, they make sleeping look fun. <laughs> they make sleeping look enjoyable they do um, maybe I'll do that maybe I'll come back <laughs> do you mind if we talk about Blue Jay a little bit yeah let's go for it well first of all it wrecked me and uh, I feel like a lot of people say this but I really don't cry often in films like it for some reason it takes like a at least at this point like I used to cry more but as I've gotten older it just takes a lot more to like hit that spot but man <laughs> Blue Jay just made me weep. So, first of all, thank you. <laughs> thank you for for creating thank that. How? Thank you more than anything. We got it. Well, you know what? I I wish I could say I created it. I think you know. Of course, definitely, right? Definitely, Mark created this one. I mean, Mark brought this idea to me and said, mm-hmm. I, "I you know it was a, it was a two page outline." And, That's so crazy. And and you know. We did a lot to it, me and him, and Sarah, and, and, and the producers. We all added stuff to it. Right. But like, you still watch the final thing, and then you reread that original original two page treatment, and you go, that seed was like, <laughs> the DNA was all in that seed. Like Mark really understood, you know, what what he wanted. He had a feeling that he wanted to explore, and um, you know, one of the things that makes a movie so successful is it. It never strayed far from that feeling that he wanted to explore. So I'm glad that I understood what he wanted. I'm glad that everybody else understood what he wanted. I'm glad we all pulled it off. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it's you know that was that was just some Duplass brilliance there. So did that feel different from Paddleton, like significantly in the in the creation process? Um, at times, but but uh, you know they they have their similarities as well. I mean. You know, Paddleton was an idea that I brought to him, but you know, he he definitely added uh, a richness to it, with, as as did Ray. But um, but yeah, I mean, Blue Jay. I don't know, Blue Jay. I mean, I could see that movie from from that even from that first two page outline. I think Paddleton took uh, a little bit more work and shape, and yeah. even editorially, we had to find it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But they were both, you know, 
they're both about exploring conflicting feelings and um, you know they're about getting emotionally deep actors to play uh, emotionally deep but less aware characters mm-hmm. and uh, you know it's just it's just I'm very lucky as a filmmaker I've gotten to work with really talented people um, that's that's life a lot easier for me <laughs> what did you learn from Blue Jay like what what sort of things did you exercise or face if anything um From the process or from the story? I would say mostly from like the story, like the emotions and the sort of reflection that they that they take part in, the more human part of it. Yeah. Um, I, I I learned that I'm not as fun as I used to be. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. Yeah. That's very poignant. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I I think that movie taught me to to um, to realize how you know most people aren't happy with who they are. Damn. Do you think you're one of those people? Uh, um, I'm not satisfied with who I am, but, uh, you know, um, yeah, no, there's, there's, yeah, I would say, uh, if you combine, uh, um, who I am and where my life is at and the things I have, you know, and the, the relationships I have, I would say, um, it's I'm I'm lucky I'm happy but there's no possible way that it all could have worked out as perfectly as I imagined it would you know that's incredible when I was just a kid trying to trying to guess what being an adult was going to be like <laughs> yeah I'll let you know when I get there it's inter- it's just, <laughs> it's interesting to me to see like like obviously I don't mean to idolize or anything, but like your position is something that of course I would like pine for. And I think I really appreciate the ability to like humanize that and just see, you know, like the unsureness that's kind of constant. So I I took this, I took the same thing from Blue Jay, a lot of reflection and a lot of, a lot of self inward looking. You know, I used to get really frustrated with um, people who make a lot of money or who, anybody who seems like they've got everything, even if they have everything, and I go, they don't seem content. They're still upset, and they might be upset about something really stupid. Like, <laughs> um, one of my friend's mom, like, she, she like, her, you know, um, hasn't worked in decades because her husband did really, really well, and... Um, they make really good income so she's got her dog kids and her really nice house so she's constantly redecorating it and like very small struggles are like <laughs> uh, uh, cataclysmic to her like the the, the, the the wrong curtain came in you know that that, that I or, like they, they shipped the wrong shade of curtains and it doesn't match the rug now and I don't think I'm gonna be able to get the new ones for like oh, another no. week and I used to roll my eyes at that shit and go oh my god so entitled like <laughs> you know you, you do the whole rich people problems or whatever but um and it still is obviously like you know it, like, it cer- certainly it's a little ridiculous to get upset about that kind of stuff <laughs> but I try to also understand you know that um it's very human to 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 have struggles to to need to have struggles because if we don't have struggles we don't have things to go after and 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 achieve and if we don't have obstacles to overcome then we don't have a purpose in life and i think we probably just turn to mush uh (laughs) our brains do our emotions do our souls do our bodies do we need things to do to make us feel useful um, both to other people and to ourselves, and so 
we all actively seek out problems and challenges, whether whether it's a great problem, like, hey, there's a village in Africa that doesn't have running water. Let me make this my challenge, and I'm going to try to, you know, overcome it by raising money and designing a pipeline system or whatever. That's a pretty productive and useful and great problem to make your own. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm worried, you know, like, my, my curtains don't match, you know, not... You know, maybe not not as uh, altruistic of a problem, <laughs> but I understand that there is a need that we that, that we find need to, to exist, and so there's a need to have these problems. And um, and even people that are self destructive and like they're giving themselves obstacles that they think they deserve, you mm-hmm. know. And it's sad to, to, to see like. That somebody thinks like this struggle is what should define me, but I understand that they need a struggle, and so that they're going to find a struggle. Um, so I've tried to be more appreciative of 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 that, and 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 more appreciative of you know people who seemingly have everything um, still not being content. Um, yeah. I understand more now how being content is inhuman. Yeah, that it is. I I had a really big realization that like to think to think that happiness is like the ultimate goal just doesn't really make sense to me. Like like obviously we want happiness, but to expect it all the time, you know, it's tough. I I think I think I get a lot of happiness from sadness or from struggle because like all the while you're like, "Hey, this is going to shape me or allow me to appreciate, you know, the good times." So yeah, well, the pursuit that. of happiness probably feels better than than happiness, or the pursuit of happiness can probably give a longer uh, feeling of fulfillment than than sitting in, in happiness. Yeah, I can agree to that. But I think there's already a movie called The Pursuit of Happiness, so we can't really <laughs> go there. Yeah, but it's misspelled on purpose, the, t- <laughs> the title, so... <laughs> So what was your, the last thing I really wanted to chat about, um, just cause I'm there is like, what was your, what was your, um, path film wise? What did you do to get to where you are? Um, I was a cinematographer for a while, um, in the industry, uh, in film school, I was directing and making my own stuff and, and my, you know, some of my friends, um, who, who were a little better off than, than me, you know, got to making some student films that had real budgets attached to them. And mm-hmm. they would see these things that I was doing, and they're like, I really like how your movie looked. You know, do you want to be part of my movie? Do you want to DP my movie? And so, um, you know, that was my opportunity to work with budgets and bigger films, bigger productions in film school. And I also felt you know, safer and more valuable there. Like, okay, I've got a marketable skill. Like, people right. like the way I think and make things look. Um, so, it lets me play. It gives me more op- of an opportunity to play in film school, and it's probably going to give me more of an opportunity to survive and eat and pay rent uh, <laughs> out in the real world. So, let me develop this skill. So, I worked on cinematography and editing as well, but mostly cinematography. And, uh, so I came out to LA and, and did that for a while. And are you from California originally? No, I uh, I was born in Paris, uh, France, and I grew up in Philly as well. Oh wow! And I went to film school in, in Boston, so it was kind of oh the place. interesting. But um, but yeah, I did like a decade of that, and 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 got a little antsy. I was like, okay, like I, I'm I'm making a, a, a you know a decent living as a cameraman. Mm-hmm but I want more. I started writing scripts and I was very bad at it uh, <laughs> because you don't just start writing good scripts right away. Um, and um, anyways, I was writing some scripts and then I was doing some research for a character who was making some jokes about Asperger's because, you know, that was a thing. Right. And um, found a, an article about this, this comedy troupe with Asperger's and I thought, I. I'm blown away. I, I, my preconceptions were people with autism aren't funny because they're logical. I should probably explore this and I'll document it. Experience. 
That's awesome. You know, as, as a of the documentary. So I made that. Um, was very, very lucky in, you know, in um, Mark Duplass seeing the doc, really liking it, wanting to come on board as an EP and help distribute it. And then... Um, yeah, you met in the league, you know, right? You and Mark? Yeah. I, was, I mean, I was, yeah, I was camera operating in the league. That was, you know, that was where my camera crew was taking me. And on my, on my weeks off, I would fly out to Boston and shoot this thing. And then on my weeks off, I would edit this thing. And it was kind of like my... My little pet project I was making, <laughs> you know, with all the extra income uh, from from being a cameraman, and put a little on a credit card and got a little bit of help <laughs> on, a, on a Kickstarter. But um, but yeah, Mark watched it, and the first couple of times that he heard about it, he was interested, but he never watched it. He would like pass it along to like a distributor or something, uh-huh. you know. Uh, and I was I was about to do a self release just on Vimeo. Excuse me, just to get it out there. And uh, I don't usually like to ask people for things. I've gotten a little better about it, but I felt uncomfortable. But I was like really believing in this doc. I was like, so I emailed him. I was like, hey man, one more time. I emailed him. I was like, yeah. I just really believe in this. And I'm about to self distribute, but I feel like it deserves more. And, and, and he watched it. You know, he was kind enough to watch it. I mean, I can imagine how many emails <laughs> and requests he can. And it's probably only grown exponentially since. Um, so I'm not telling everybody to just, <laughs> just email Mark. Email him three times and then he'll watch it or he'll read it or whatever. <laughs> you know, or he'll hire you. It's probably, it's probably up to five now. So email Mark to class at least five times. But yeah, I was very lucky in that he watched. Helped get it out there and, and he invited me to to be the director slash cinematographer you know that worked out great for us we really enjoyed the process and uh, we made a couple more things together and um, I feel very lucky I, I think that most people who work in the business who work hard and develop skills and keep their eyes and ears open and smile and are friendly and meet people if they stay out here long enough, they will get an opportunity or two similar to mine, you know. That's good to hear. With with, with their Mark Duplass or their studio or their whatever. It takes, a, it takes a while, and, you know, when that opportunity comes, hopefully you've got, you know, the skill set and the work ethic mm-hmm. to make the best of that opportunity. But I think usually people are going to be given that option from time to time if they're persistent yeah. and if they... It might take 10 years, it might take 20 years. Usually that, you know, one or two opportunities will pop up in a career. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to find mine and, you know, I feel like I've made the most of it. And, That's awesome. But I feel really, really appreciative, really thankful that, that I did get that opportunity. thing. So where do you go from here? What do you, what do you, what aspirations do you still have? I quit. <laughs> I go out on top like Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> Yeah, you know, making making more movies with <laughs> more people that I respect and, and and have gotten to meet, and, you know, and I'm interested in working in. And, um, I have some friends, some young filmmaker friends, who have brought really cool ideas to me that I, I'm trying to champion their ideas and even maybe work on some of them with them. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm just. Uh, Every time, every time a movie comes out, every time a plot of mine comes out, and like for like a week or two, it's celebrating, high fiving, creators, uh, getting to do some fancy interviews, and you know, <laughs> maybe a party or two. Uh, that 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 wears off pretty quickly, and then and then I just feel thrown back into this massive pile of talented filmmakers trying to get their next thing made. Yeah, and um. There's a lot of talent in, in this industry. There are a lot of really smart, really cool, really talented people who work really hard. And even with the, the, all the Netflixes and Hulus and Amazons and everything that's out there, um, there's still a lot of talent that isn't being showcased. So, um, so I just, every day I, I, I try to hustle and, and hope that I get another opportunity to make something but um, I don't feel entitled 
uh, to, to, to any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, uh, keep hoping that I get, you know, lucky and get more chances to work hard. That's good. Well, I appreciate what you've done a lot and I wish you the best. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. I enjoyed our conversation. We got deep. Yeah. Thank you for talking to me today. I appreciate that. I'm, uh, I might move to LA in a few years, so I hope I hope you and I's paths cross at some point. Yes, absolutely. I'll send you. Yeah, when you're coming out here. I'll send you five emails at some point in the future. So. Oh, I'm not. A, I, I'm. I'm still at the one email. <laughs> <laughs> I, I respond to people with one email. Maybe you'll be. Sometimes it's like, hey, I'm busy for the next month or two. Uh, please email me again, but but. Maybe you'll be at like two or three emails by the time I get to you. I don't know. Oh, that'd be pretty good because then I'm definitely yeah if I'm at the three stage then the good thing is I'm probably doing well enough that like I can good lunch <laughs> um, but it's only three emails so it didn't cost much <laughs> well I got a couple years of school left so uh, we'll see okay well I'll either be really rich by then <laughs> and extremely successful or I will have been kicked out of the industry uh, scandal never allowed to return or possibly somewhere in between <laughs> well thank you so much Alex I, I loved talking to you and I really appreciate you taking the time same same hope to talk thank to you, you soon and, man and reach out when you come out to LA okay of course take it easy right. so I guess uh, since Paddleton's come out how how have your feelings about it been in general? Oh, I mean, my feelings have always been the same about Paddleton. I've always was as soon as I heard about the idea for this movie, I was really excited. Um, I loved the early cuts that I saw, and I loved the cut that I got to work on, uh, which was pretty close to what you see now. I don't think it didn't change all that much from when I started working on it, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think it turned out really well. I'm I'm really happy about it. You know, I mean, one of my favorite projects that I ever worked on was Blue Jay, and this is you know essentially the same team right. as Blue Jay. So I knew it was going to be a good experience and a good movie. Awesome. How did you end up working? I mean, I know you've known Mark and stuff for a minute. So how did uh, how did Paddleton come about? Was it just kind of a continuation of your guys's relationship? Yeah, I mean, we were all really, you know, me, Mark, and Mel Eslin, and Alex Lehman, who produced, I mean, sorry, who directed um, Blue Jay. Um, you know, we had such a good time working on Blue Jay, and we all kind of agreed that it turned out it was a good team, you know, and that, like, mm -hmm. I think they really liked the music I made for it and felt like it was a big part of it. So as soon as they had envisioned Paddleton, they just, you know, sort of more casually got in touch with me saying, we're going to need, we're, you know, we're going to want you to do this one, too. Right. Um, so it was not a hard, you know, it was not like a difficult, uh, job to get and it wasn't a hard decision to say yes. I mean, I, it, with that same team, I was going to be on board, mm -hmm. you know, is, is that when you guys started working together was around blue Jay time or did you meet before then? I mean, I've been working with Mark since like 2009 or 2010, honestly. Um, I, I scored a movie that he, I think he produced, but that his wife, uh, Katie Aselton, uh, wrote and directed called the freebie so that was my f probably my first experience working with him gotcha. um right after that i scored him and jay's movie dodecapentathlon so i mean i've been working with him for a long time so blue jay wasn't necessarily like a new thing as much as it was just sort of a new form which was um i was the first time i worked with alex that's for sure uh, mm -hmm. i didn't really know him before then but we had a great time working together on that so gotcha how do you um Especially with Paddleton and Blue Jay, which uh, messed me up real good. <laughs> How do you deal with, um, do you, like, do you feel very connected to the material? Do you, do you try to like get in the heads of the characters? Does the story and stuff like mean a lot to you, or do you just try to f like fit the music? Like, how intimate do you feel with it? Um. Well, it's both, I suppose. I mean, it's probably more of like an unconscious intimacy. Like, mm -hmm. I don't sit down and be like, okay, like, let me think about, like, what Andy or Michael are feeling right now. It just kind of happens. And I think that's maybe something that I'm good at. Um, 
there's a lot of stuff I'm not good at, but I do think I'm good at it sort of just like not having to think about the emotional nature of a scene. I mm-hmm. can just kind of feel it. And I mean, then like I have to use my sort of like hodgepodge musical skills to make something good, but I, I always feel it and that's good. I feel like that definitely gets me somewhere. Um, right. So yeah, so like you said, it's not like conscious. It's not like I'm like, oh, like what's Andy feeling here? I just think that like, especially working with this team, like the material, it's very clear to me on some level what what's going on and what's needed musically. And I just kind of like, it just kind of washes over me and I feel it. And sometimes if it's good, I don't remember making it. And that's a good sign. <laughs> if I like listen to the cue later, I'm like, I don't remember making this. That usually <laughs> is good. And that so happens sometimes. It seems tough because like, like you have your band and stuff. So like, I'm sure you make music where it's like an expression of yourself. So when you're doing it, when you're doing it as kind of a job for someone else, even though it's like a collaboration, like, do you think the scenes include a lot of your feelings as well? Like, like in Blue Jay and Paddleton, is the music like still pretty heavily like an expression of how you feel? Or do you feel like, like more detached to it since it's for something else? If, th- if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, on these particular projects, I don't feel particularly detached from the music. I mean, Blue Jay especially is a movie that really... I mean, I don't necessarily identify with the story of Blue Jay. I didn't have that particular experience, but Mm -hmm. I do think there's something universal about wanting to sort of revisit or relive the past, you know, and the sort of glorification of the past. I mean, that's like part of nostalgia, I suppose, you know. Um, But nostalgia is very important to me, and Blue Jay was such a nostalgic movie that like I really just, I felt like, I mean, you're, you're right. That, like, obviously, if you're making music with a band, you can theoretically make whatever music you want. Um, right. That's true. Um, and I'm seeing, like, if you imagine, like, a film is sort of maybe gives you some electric fencing. <laughs> like, don't go past this point, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And maybe it's, like, explicit or maybe it's more implied, but maybe it's, like, we don't want any synthesizers on this score. Or maybe it's, like, you know, the movie, I'm not talking about any Paddleton or Blue Jay. I'm just speaking generally right now. Maybe you get a mm-hmm. job where it's like, you know, you know what? We envision this being a lot uh, funnier and it's not playing quite as funny. So maybe we can use music to help that. And now you've kind of got like a specific job to do, mm-hmm. um, which is fun. I mean, that's like a great challenge, but it certainly means that like you have to keep that in mind as you do your work. Um, yeah. And if that's that's sort of like maybe the, the fencing, I don't mean to call it electric fencing. That's very uh, that's really, really rough. But, you know, it, it's a border. It sets up a border for you. You can't just sort of adventure anywhere you'd like musically. Um, but I will say that, like, I never hit the border on Blue Jay or Paddleton. I definitely felt right away, like, an area that I really wanted to be in for those movies and that I got to be in. And I never got to a border where it was like, you know what, this is like, this is something I really want to do for this movie that's not right for it. And that was a good feeling. I mean, I feel like that made me a good fit for those movies. But I always felt like if I was... If I was at all fenced in, I certainly couldn't see the fence. It was too far away. <laughs> That's very special. So yeah. thinking, thinking about it is special. Um, nostalgia, as you mentioned, do you, is that something that? Okay, so just a just a preface. I'm 19, so mm-hmm. anything I say, you know, aim to see that through a lens of <laughs> of a 19 year old. So I'm uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very no. eager to learn from the people that I that I chat with. So a lot of a lot of the questions I ask are honestly just trying to like figure out, you know, like what's to come or, or kind of That's just, great. just, just compare like where I'm going to be. So is, is nostalgia better than when I was 19? <laughs> That's what a lot of people say. <laughs> yeah. Um, is nostalgia something that like, cause you said it's very important to you. Is it something that hits you often? And, and when it does, does it feel like, I, okay, so I'll go on a little bit of a tangent. So, like, when I feel nostalgia, yeah, go ahead. It's usually like for my childhood kind of feeling, just because I'm becoming an adult and stuff. And like, part of it's just happy that it's ha- like, how much of it is like happy that it happened, and then how much of it is like a genuine longing, like for a different time. Like, try to walk me through what nostalgia like is to you when it does hit you. I mean, I don't live in the past, but. Um... I certainly don't want to go back. I mean, there are certain like moments that I wish I could relive, you know, certain days that Mm -hmm. it would be great if I could just, and I certainly, I mean, you're probably a college student or maybe you're not a college student. I don't know. I don't mean to presume, but 
You know, I certainly often think about how my college experience, I was pretty miserable a lot of the time. Like I was pretty sullen and I was angry and I was, um, yeah, it does suck. I mean, but you know, that's just how I, I was stressed. I was, you know, I just wasn't feeling great during that time. And, um, when I look back, it's very silly. It feels very silly how unhappy I was because, I mean, I certainly had responsibilities, but no like real responsibilities, hmm. you know, and that was almost 20 years ago that I started college. And uh, I don't know. I mean, they say youth is wasted on the young and I would maybe add that college is wasted on college students. But so I hope <laughs> you enjoy it because um, it, I won't, I, it was not the best years of my life, but it certainly was a nice time to sort of have like just enough structure that I had to be somewhere. But I pretty much, you know, more or less had time to do whatever I wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, I did. I mean, it's funny now. Like I think about them being like, I'm so busy. I've got class and homework <laughs> and I got to read this book. I got this paper to write. Um, but I mean, really my life was like a playground and it's funny to think. So, I mean, that's part of nostalgia, sort of like, it's not even regret. Cause I don't regret, I don't really regret much. It's more just sort of an observation that my perception of that time at the time, the way I perceived it when I was experiencing it is probably really different. And I try to keep that in mind because even now, like I'm like in 10 years, I may look back on this time and have a very different perception right. of what it was. Um, so that's good to, I mean, I guess nostalgia can be very humbling in that regard to not sort of be too much, not to make too many proclamations about where you're at or what life yeah. is like at any moment or to, you know, just try to avoid being too unhappy or too happy. Um, because you may look back and think that, gosh, that was so silly how happy I was then or how unhappy I was then. It's all, it all, it all, and that's the great thing about nostalgia. All kind of like washes away in like a hazy mess anyway. And it's all sort of like gauzy and like, oh yeah, I remember the good times. I mean, I'm sure <laughs> I had a lot of genuinely bad times when I was in college or just, I mean, I really was unhappy a lot and it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like because of my situation. It was probably because I was 19. I mean, I don't know. You seem pretty happy, but I certainly... <laughs> I wasn't happy when I was I have my particularly days, happy man. when I was 19. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> um but yeah, I mean same with like childhood. I mean, I was like a very lonely, like sad child, you know? Like I came home from school like <laughs> with stomach aches a lot and I had anxiety and um when I think about it now, I mean, I think about the days I came home from school, it's like really wonderful days. I you know, even though I was probably feeling really bad and feeling really miserable, I came home and started watching like Nickelodeon or Nick Jr. or something. And mm-hmm. it's a very like warm and cozy feeling to think about now. So I wonder yeah, how again, I don't want to read like, how what works. Like how we like you can go through a really shitty time in your life. But like when you look back on it, like you think of the, the good times rather than the bad. Because like, I mean, same thing, you know, I, I wonder if how much of it is like subconscious or if it's just gen- generally applies to like optimists and pessimists. Like when you look uh, back, I mean, I think it's probably evolutionary because I think it's like a, an advantage, an evolutionary advantage to not remember pain. I mean, I don't think we necessarily can remember pain. You can remember like that you were in pain, mm-hmm. but you can't really remember pain. Like, yeah, if you try to remember what it felt like, you're not going to remember it's the weird. pain. And I think yeah. it's weird. I and mean, you can more easily remember pleasure. And I think that's sort of an advantage to, you know, sort of like help us through painful thing. I mean, you can remember, I guess, remember pain that was dangerous, but like childbirth's a good example. You don't really remember the pain of childbirth. You remember that it was painful, but kind of like, I don't know, wants you to just move along and probably try to do it again, you know? Yeah. Um, It's tough because like, especially now I'm just every day considering the fact, like I know for a fact that in five years, six, seven 10 years the person that i am now i'll probably laugh at or <laughs> probably you know judge or something Prob- so it's, probably so it's t- it's tough to know that and then like not get caught up in it and try to like yeah. make <laughs> every day like something that i'm going to be proud of in the future because then that's just silly because you can't live in the future and you can't live in the past either so but you also don't want to like like I, I got in this really weird way maybe probably my freshman year of college because I'm going into my junior year um, in the fall. Mm-hmm. 
and I just got in this moment where like I kind of had this revelation about that and and then I just kept thinking like every day or like every time I hung out with my friends and stuff that like it needed to be like a moment like it needed to be a thing you know like Mm -hmm. like I don't I don't necessarily think I've fallen into the the pattern of trying to do like crazy stuff or like like I don't really party it's just not my scene but like I, I don't know I'll just do things sometimes and just feel in the moment like I'm going to remember this really well and it's like that's kind of scary sometimes because I don't want to think that too much in the moment. <laughs> and yeah. I think, and I think like the best example of that is like people recording at concerts because concerts are like, for me, like the best thing, like they just make me so happy. It, it's just like the most dopamine rushing experience that I can get. Like just going to a concert with some friends and just experiencing like your favorite things live. And that's incredible. Nice. But when you record it, like you're actively sacrificing present self for future self and it's just kind of weird because like i don't know maybe it's because we just look at ourselves as like there's a linearity to it but i've tried to be a lot more present and it's weird because like concerts that i went to four or five years ago i don't remember like i don't remember them super (laughs) well i remember how awesome it was and i remember like the feelings of certain songs hitting at first but like you don't remember it like super super specifically so when it comes to that, like having videos of it is really cool because you're like, oh yeah, and it, it does bring back feelings that you couldn't have otherwise. But yeah. then you think like, you know, I, I may have sacrificed a little bit of that while I was actually there, which defeats the purpose of the thing. So I don't know. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but I've just been, I, I've been trying to think about things like that lately. Like not everything has to be like a moment that you can put in a scrapbook or something like. No, most know. things aren't really. To live for your present self is really awesome because to get like super honest and morbid, like you, you're going to die. So at least, you know, like if I did something really awesome today and I lived it fully today and then I died tomorrow, you know, I'd be, I'd be happier that I did that rather than recording it or, or thinking about it too much. Yeah. Or, and you can sometimes catch people like, you know, like I feel like when you're with friends and you're doing something like new, like, I don't know. Okay. So for example, the other day I was just riding in a golf cart with my friends, like listening Mm -hmm. to CCR and it was nighttime and we were going really fast. And it was one of those things where like something like that doesn't happen all the time. And you just feel this energy of like, this is awesome. Like this is a very nice memory, especially because, you know, we're all not going to be as close as we are and, and haven't been as, as time's gone on. And so you feel this energy of like, this is a really great thing. And you can just sense people sometimes trying to like hold on to that. I don't know. I'm gonna stop. I want. I'm here, curious to hear your thoughts on any of that. Yeah. I mean, well, on what part? Whatever you want. <laughs> I talked a lot. Just a, just yeah. about living in the present and about you know trying to see memories before they're even memories. That kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think it's nice to acknowledge when something is something you know that's a nice thing because life isn't always easy or good so and when you can have an experience like you did with last night in the golf cart ccr the night air and all that and you can like take a moment to acknowledge that like this is a thing i think that's good Mm -hmm. because if you don't sort of acknowledge it it can just blow by you and you know that doesn't mean you need to linger on it and obsess over that experience for the next like 20 years i mean you could if you want and you might make good art from sort of like exploring that experience right but um i think maybe like the most sort of psychologically healthy thing is to just um acknowledge it and let it pass because like it's just it's fleeting and the less you like hold on to positive experiences the more easily you can let go of negative ones i think i mean do you meditate keaton yeah i do i that's great i I mean i I need to I, I need to tighten down on it and really find a regimen, but but yeah. I, I took a Asian philosophy class and it was very eye opening. Mm, yeah, so, I mean that's so good really stuff, you know. To. It's tough. It's so it's so weird. Like, because I'm generally an anxious person. Um, mm-hmm. I've never been on medication or been diagnosed with anything, but I've always just been able to tell like there's just a thing, you know. Like there's just that general sure. like eh. And I've I've had a couple panic eh. attacks in my life, so like. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say it's abnormal, but there's def- definitely something there that like I've talked to people about it and they're like, what? So that kind of thing. And yeah, you and, know, you're di- you know, you're different. 
Right, and that comes to a or, head when you know, when I meditate sometimes because like I've gotten a lot better at it since I've gotten older, but it just sort of like when you have that weight on you that like the days kind of just like laying it on thick. Like this week, for example, has just been like nutso for me, like the craziest week of the year, and like it, you just feel this like weight that's not there, but it just keeps laying on, and like no matter how smart you are and like your your awareness that like that's just you know that's just energy from the past. Like it's really hard to like push that off, and when I meditate, I like feel all of that at once, and it's really weird because, like, I don't mm-hmm. have the best back posture, and like my back has always had a tiny bit of issues. But whenever you sit to like meditate, I always like itch, and I feel like every ache, and I've only gotten past that a couple of times, and I think that's a very very interesting place, where you stop like, feeling all of those things at once. Like, I, I feel well, like I, I, I actually understand what meditation is trying to get at the more I try to do it. Well, yeah, I mean, I think what med, I mean, for me, like for the practices that I practice, I mm-hmm. mean, which are a couple different ones, but they both would sort of, I think, suggest the same thing regarding what you just brought up, which is that like, y- there's nothing to the itch you feel. It's just a sensation and mm-hmm. it happens and then it goes away. And it doesn't mean that you in meditation doesn't free you from an itch. Right. It just like it, it just helps you get to the point to realize that like there is no you like and all there is is sort of like your observations of consciousness and your itch is just an observation of consciousness. It's mm-hmm. not really anything other than that. Right, it's not a right. distraction from your meditation. It's actually something to be acknowledged um, just like your breath or, you know, the pain in your back or feeling sleepy. They're all just like observations of consciousness. I don't mean to be a meditation teacher. I've just like, it just, it's, it's one of those things that like kept me from meditation for years. Cause I was like, Oh, like I'm not doing it right. Cause I keep thinking right. about stuff or I'm itchy or like my eyes twitching or I have to pee, you know? And like, that's actually part of it. It's not so much that like you've met by meditating, you like free yourself of bodily concerns in a way you do free yourself of bodily concerns because you just, you just acknowledge that they are experiences of consciousness and observations of consciousness and they pass or they don't, but they kind of have nothing to do with anything. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, maybe it It, will one day. I mean, I don't know. You should take a meditation class or use like one of those apps or something. They're very helpful. I really should. I, I think learning about, um, Buddhism and, and a lot of like, Asian philosophies is has been really revelatory in the sense of like I don't know I'm just I I always consider myself pretty receptive to like philosophy and stuff and then because I'm majoring in philosophy I'm double majoring in philosophy Mm. and film so it's like pretty Mm. heavy but but I've done a lot of intensive philosophical readings and like you know a lot of classes on it and it was kind of this thing where it's like I I really like philosophy I want to be the guy that likes philosophy it's like it, it makes my brain excited you know when like I hear stuff and then like I don't know. I just felt like I finally got it a lot more when I took that class because I, I don't, I mean, I know it's like a human thing, but you always go into something like wanting to feel like, you know what you're talking about, even if you don't, like you just want to feel like you don't have complete, like no grounding. But then when you like read some of like the teachings, it's wild how like I, I could actually, I could actively feel myself like perceiving reality entirely different. And it was like, whoa, like I would wake up the next day and be like, I don't see things at all the way I used to. And, Mm. and, and it's exactly what you were talking about that inspired me to say that because it's just the idea that like, like, I don't know. I, I, it was, it was this really long seminar. Um, this, this female speaker, I can't remember what her name is, but she was just talking about how like, you know, all of your issues and, and your relationships and the deaths in your life and your hair and everything like that's just not you at all. Like, it's a story that you're telling, and, like, it's a part of what makes you continue. But, like, the only thing that you can undeniably have confidence in that's you is just the fact that you are conscious and observing in general. Indeed. Indeed. That's really, that's all there is. It's wild. And when she said that, I I don't know why, and and it kind of defeats the purpose because it's still, like, a thing. But when she said that, I pictured this, like, orange, like, little peanut-sized, like, ball above my head. Like when she said that, that like that went in my head, and then for the next like week, I was in this super weird like mental state where everything I was doing, I felt like I was just that thing like above my head, and that I didn't have any feelings about what I was doing, and that I didn't need to hold on to things too much, 
and it was really, really special. And I want to get back to that place. And I feel like meditation is like a, a really, a really good, a really good path to get back there because that, that was like the most excited I'd felt about living because like, mm. I don't know. It's weird because at the end of the day, for me, when I'm learning things, it's like the goal feels like I'm trying to make my life as easy as it can be. I'm trying to make it as, 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 you know, as fluent and like harmless as possible. But then when like, when you read things like that, you have to realize, well, you can't even do that. You can't even like, you can't put it on yourself. You still, you're still attaching yourself to it. You're still making it. Oh, like Keaton had the revelation of blank and blank. Whereas you have to actually realize like, like that's not you at all. And that's just like super freeing. And it's weird because it's freeing, but to who, you know, because you can't attach it to yourself too much. But yeah, yeah, do what but you freeing will with that. nonetheless. Yeah, freeing nonetheless. So yeah, um, what sucked about college for you? <laughs> What's that? What sucked about college for you? Oh, nothing in particular. I just was sullen, you know, just like a sullen boy. Um, <laughs> y- you know. Um, I was a very, I was like an overachiever in high school. I mm-hmm. did very well in high school and, you know, I kind of like did that out of fear of not getting into a good college. That was sort of like one of my main motivators all through high school. Yeah. And then like one day I sort of realized like, oh, well, what does that even mean? Going to a good college is sort of like, then you do like do more homework. You know, I was really like, <laughs> didn't have a lot of like thoughts for the future. It was more sort of like my present experience and I just kind of, bur- I just felt a little burned out when I started. So I sort of like, um, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I mean, I wouldn't say I did the bare minimum, but I did pretty close, like sort of starting out just sort of like trying to tread water and like enjoy myself as best I could. And like the thing, the, the truth of the matter is I had an amazing time. I mean, it's funny, like just at the time I was like very like unhappy and like bitter, you know, it's just part of being young, I suppose. I mean, not everybody's a bitter young person, but I certainly felt that way. And like, again, like it just feels so, it feels like silly now. It feels like a real, like real waste of energy. Yeah. But it was what it was, you know? What'd you go There's to really school There's really nothing for? to be done about. Well, I ended up studying music. Um, it was, the nature I have is called music science and technology. So it was sort of like a mix of music. There was like some music mm-hmm. theory. Well, here's the thing. There were two music buildings. There was like one music building where like you could study musicology and music theory and music history and all like the sort of that stuff, you know, sort of traditional, you know, for lack of a better word, like classical music information. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like a music library and practice rooms and all that stuff. And then there was like a separate building up the hill, which was sort of like a, it was actually, um, I always joke that it was condemned, but only the third floor was condemned, which is kind of a funny thing <laughs> that one floor of a building can be condemned. I think it was really just like the third floor was not structurally sound, so you couldn't go up there, but there was two floors. And that was the that was like where that place is called uh, Karma, CCRMA, the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. And that wow. was where there was re- there was recording studios up there. There was a lot of like Linux machines or that you could like sort of do various programming languages to make very old computer music. We made music in something called C sound. We made music in a programming language called Lisp. You can look them up if you'd like, but it's a pretty interesting way to make music. I don't necessarily recommend it. If you're trying to make What's music it today, I'm not sure. Well, one's called C sound like, and the other's called Lisp L I S P. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know where to begin how to compile those, but you know, I kind of <laughs> remember how to write for them a little bit. We also used a program called Pure Data, which is was like sort of the free ver- like the free version of Max MSP. You may know Max MSP or some of your listeners yeah, yeah. may know Max MSP is like a kind of a modular graphical programming language. And so the guy who invented Max MSP was at Karma, I believe, and then like when he sold Max MSP, he developed like a f- uh, open source version called Pure Data PD. Um so uh, anyway, we did a lot of stuff with those. We did stuff with like human computer interfaces. I was involved in a project where we made uh, what we called musical udders. That was the working title. I think the hmm. the ending title for it was something different, but I like to call them the musical udders because it really just like a pair of silicone udders <laughs> that you could kind of squish and manipulate to make music. That sounds weird. It was weird. Um, 
And so that stuff was really neat. I mean, it was really cool. I mean, I don't necessarily use any of the information. It's funny because at the time I was like really more focused on the the stuff that was going on at Karma. And I really didn't like the stuff that was in the music theory building. Mm-hmm. Um, I just felt out of place, you know? I mean, everybody else in my music program had been playing like a classical instrument since they were like five. And I was coming from more of like a rock background, you know, just being in bands in high school and playing guitar. I couldn't read music, you know? I had to take like mm-hmm. remedial music reading classes. I still suck at reading music. Um, <laughs> so I always felt a little bit like, maybe this isn't my scene or maybe I'm not good at this. And I felt a little bit more at home with the Linux machines and the recording studio and all that stuff. Um, but it's funny to this day, I probably use more of the music theory education I got than anything I learned huh. at, at karma. And that's not to, that's not to say anything bad about karma. Actually what karma provided me with was like a very expansive view of like what music is. Um, I probably would have like come into my music program with like a real rigid, like this is music and this is not, uh, right. you know what I mean? Sort of like rules about what is music. And I, I, my, my definition of music is pretty, pretty wide at this point. <laughs> and I would just say that music is organized audio. And I would, I would like amend that by saying the organization could happen from the composer. The composer could be the one that organizes it. Or you could be the one that organizes it in your brain. Because, like, I mean, if you've ever been to, like, a bamboo forest and heard the wind go through the bamboo, it's music. I mean, especially if you organize it as such, it's music. I mean, so is, like, the oscillations of your HVAC compressor outside, you know? It's music. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not music to everybody, but if you choose to organize it as such, it's music. How do you feel about um, John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence well let me throw it back at you is that organized audio or not i mean it is organized there is a composition sheet to it then it's yeah it's organized therefore it's music it's just interesting because it's fluid you know like so yeah you're right so it doesn't have to be repeatable it doesn't have to be like um what's the word i'm looking for like it doesn't have to be the same every time i guess like because because regardless of where he goes there's still audio and it's still there was still a you know a venue rented out, and he still sits at a piano, and it's still like a thing. So I guess yep. it is it is still organized, and there always will be audio, even if everyone's trying to be quiet. There's still like the creaking of the building and things right. like that. Yeah. Well, it's also commentary sense. because it's also like organized lack of audio. I mean, like silence is music too. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, this, because what is what is music without the silences? I mean, if music was going all the time, you would barely notice it because you need silence. So that's just sort of a different right. take on the concept of silence, I think. So yeah, I mean, that's an easy one for me. I mean, I don't know, you, you'll be hard pressed to throw anything at me that that I would <laughs> say wasn't music. Um, I'm not sure you'll be able to think of something because I've not been able to think of something that isn't music. It just it's music if you choose. I mean, essentially, it's music if you hear it as such, you know? Yeah, it's that's really how I hard feel to, about it. To say it's not. You know, I think some people are obviously more, you know, they hear like noise music and like, that's not music. I'm like, well, that's just not really fair to like say that that's right. not music. You may not like it and that's totally fair. You don't have to like any music. Right. But if somebody organized it, I mean, I mean, I would say like for me, like good music suggests this is a something my professor once said he said good you know i think he said something along the lines of good music suggests industriousness and i do feel that i mean sometimes Mm. when you hear music that you can feel that somebody like put effort into as opposed to sort of like let happen randomly like there is like something there and i i I don't think that's like a blanket statement but i do appreciate it when i hear music that someone definitely like you know worked on as opposed to like just let happen but that said i mean you you know the thing is like i mean who's to say someone if someone went and made a recording of the bamboo forest with the wind blowing through the bamboos and sort of you know making sort of wooden wind chime sounds they certainly put effort in to go out and record it you know and they put effort into thinking about that that's something people might like to listen to Mm -hmm. but you know, I don't think it's it's definitely still not a value judgment, but I do think that there is like maybe some kind of correlation between good music and industriousness. I like it. I mean, I like to be industrious over my music to sort of be thoughtful about it. But that said, there's mm-hmm. always room for like things to just happen. But things right. good things tend to happen when you work hard. I do think that's true. Yeah, for sure. You know, if if you have all your stuff set up and you're sitting there working hard and you're like thinking about your music all the time and and focusing on it like 
when an accident happens, it's because you were there to catch it. You know what I mean? It didn't just right. happen while you were like doing something else. Although doing something else can be great too. Cause I mean, I, my work process is more like, I like to get a project. I like to think about it a lot. I like to sort of not work on it in the way that would look traditional, like working, which is like me at a keyboard or me at my studio mm -hmm. working. But I'm certainly thinking about and cranking the wheel so that when I do finally sit down, like things start to happen. You know what I mean? So yeah. I could spend that time like banging my head against the piano or I can spend that time <laughs> sort of, like thinking about it. And maybe that and I'm, honestly, maybe that includes taking walks or playing video games or sort of just just yeah. not making music. I feel that like getting revelations um, while you're doing other things entirely. You're like, oh, that's kind of like that could work. That could definitely work. Indeed. Even when you're not. Indeed, doing it music. can. Indeed, it can. But that's a thin line to, that's a thin, I mean, I've seen, you know, people take that to the extreme <laughs> and then they don't do the music, but you know, it's all about like your headspace if you're thinking yeah. about it. I mean, I think some people would convince themselves that they're thinking about work while they're playing video games. I genuinely am. I promise you this. <laughs> video games are incredible. Brain. They brain. are. They're What wonderful. kind of games do you play? Well, I play like every system from like probably, you know original nintendo through ps2 mm -hmm. and then i also have a switch i skipped a few generations but i have a switch now which i really like it's a really great game system mm -hmm. um i have a retro pie which is like a raspberry pie that i've set up yeah i have one to, too yeah you have one too great yeah what a great what a great toy that it's is incredible. i've had so much fun <laughs> there's with so that. much stuff there's so much to enjoy i mean i i do like old games because I don't know. They're both easy and fun. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the thing is, like, the original Zelda is, like, somewhat easy, but it's also, like, frustrating enough that I don't want to play it for, like, hours on end. It's sort of, like, <laughs> time limited. And I kind of like that. Um, I also just really yeah. like the music for, for old games, you know, anything oh, like yeah. third or fourth generation, I really like the music for. I mean, I, I do like some of the music for the Switch games, but at a certain point, like, video game music just became, like, regular music. As soon as it wasn't yeah. like, based on a chip... As soon as it wasn't based on a chip anymore, it sort of just became, like, regular music, and it I lost something. Sure. Even though, like, I do think there's some great compositions in the new, like, Mario Odyssey game. I guess it's not new anymore, but <coughs> there's some really great music in there. Ironically, most of the really great songs in Mario Odyssey... Are from Koji Kondo, who is a, was started out as a chip programmer. So I think that there's something to that. That even if you're no longer making music on a mm -hmm. chip, the sort of association of like making video game music on a chip as you bring that into like a band or orchestra setting, it does kind of inform. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I've been playing a lot of Tony Hawk games. You ever into those? Mm. Of course, yeah. I never was into them, but I always appreciated them. I mean, I didn't those play a like lot of sports games. games man. Yeah, yeah, those are fun. I mean, I think I played one once. I mean, those were really famous for having like lots of like pop songs in them, right? Like you kind of discover like yeah, various like really pop good, punk and really good soundtracks. You know, good like good soundtracks with like like lots of you punk know, and then music. also like a lot of rap, a lot of just yeah. random like seventies funk sometimes, but mostly just like like some Public Enemy, and then I don't know, I think. Who else is on? I think KRS One is on a couple, but lots of punk, well, yeah, lots and lots of punk, lots of punk. Well, you ever go to like YouTube and you find like a YouTube of like a song you want to hear, and then like the comments will be like Tony Hawk brought me here, like you know, <laughs> like if Tony Hawk yeah. brought you here. So that's like a funny thing that people like to like let you know on the YouTube video, like why I they know. came there. It's interesting. It's like a funny little thing that like is just customary now. Like the top comment on like <laughs> a YouTube video will be like. Tony Hawk brought me here, like whatever, whatever the thing that brought you there was. I mean, it's just like something like had to bring you there. Mad I suppose. about it. Some people are like, well, yeah, like there'll be two different things that use that music, <laughs> like maybe a TV show, and then like, or even some people will be like, Blank didn't bring me here. The music brought me here. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's a good oh, one man. too. Like something still that's brought a good you one here. Too. <laughs> Whether it was yeah, your I mean, I think that or... just. It's just posturing. It's just like people wanting to feel like I like this because what they perceived as sort of like a superior reason for liking it as opposed right. to like hearing it in a video game, which they perceive as like sort of a lesser or sort of more like poser. I don't know. Poser reason for liking it. I'm not saying I think that. I'm just saying that's what right. they seem to think that like if you had like the CD that supersedes if you heard it in a movie and if you started heard it in a movie that like somehow is like superior to finding it in a video game. But <laughs> I don't know. I think it's funny, personally. What other video games do you play? Oh, well, my favorites, 
my favorite video game creator is probably Kojima above mm-hmm. all else. Like I just Metal Gear blows me away every time. Like like Metal Gear 4 from I think that was like 2008 maybe. Like that game today still just blows my mind. But I really like Metal yeah, Gear. No. Um Never I really like the one. Uncharted series. I really like Cuphead actually, and I'm not I'm not a big mm-hmm. like side scroller, but I really got into Cuphead uh, last year, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And then I like I I used to play Call of Duty when I was younger, and sometimes I'll play it just because I'm like good at it, and like sometimes it's just fun. Mm-hmm. But but I used to I used to like those some sports games, but then um, I really like some like old side scrollers. Like I play the Simpsons arcade game a lot, and then uh, oh yeah, really that's like, a good one. Yeah, and then I like fighting games a lot, like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, and Tekken. Those are really, really fun for me. So, yeah, it's a nice little... Oh, and Fallout. I love Fallout. Those games. Oh, Fallout, are... yeah. I gotta. I, I really yeah, want never... to get lost in one of those this summer again, because it's been years. Yeah, I mean, those are... I mean, role-playing games are my favorite. Role-playing yeah. games and simulations. Anything slow, I like. Do you, you like know. Fallout, then? Or Skyrim, or anything I've never like played that? Fallout or Skyrim. I'm more of, like, a JRPG person gotcha, myself. Gotcha. Um, I've always, like... I don't know. I'm not against American RPGs. I've just always, like... The only one I've really gotten into is, like, probably the Ultima. Well, that's not even American. I think that's British. But th- that's only, like, Western RPG I've ever been super into. I don't mm-hmm. know what it is. It's just a sensibility thing. I just have always really, like, gravitated toward, like... Final Fantasy and Squaresoft games and like yeah. um, Enix games and just any or you know yeah that's just my thing that's just what I like. I There's like, something I, about I'm it. I'm weird because I like to sometimes like I feel like when I'm playing video games it's like usually a thing like either I'm playing a video game for the story like I'll do like like I, I played Heavy Rain a couple years ago or like. Mm-hmm. I'll replay an old game like for the story. Like when Uncharted Four came out, I replayed all the old ones, and I actually just started mm-hmm. playing the newest Tomb Raider, and that's really really fun. But sometimes oh, I'll cool. sit down yeah, and I like play to- the I story. I like Tomb Raider games. Yeah, Tomb Raider's awesome. And then other times those. I'll just like put Tony Hawk on, and then just listen to music, and just like I'll just be like doing nothing, you know. So it's, yeah, it's a really yeah. different experience. But I love getting like connected to a game. And it feels like I'm watching a TV show or something, and I just want to get back to it. I love that feeling. Yeah, so. it's awesome. It's awesome, and it's an opportunity for storytelling that's like even sort of more serialized than a TV. I mean, if a movie's one thing, and then a season of TV is another thing. I mm-hmm. mean, if you think about like a 40-hour role-playing game, that's a whole other thing, and right. some of them are even longer. That's a very long commitment. I mean, it's crazy. if you're counting by episodes, that's like you know maybe four seasons of 10 episodes that you could Uh, get through in a game and it's not all story i mean obviously there's like you got to fight the battles and go around the dungeons and stuff Mm -hmm. but it is a very like long commitment that i really appreciate and i mean at the the apex of that type of storytelling is incredible i mean i don't know if you ever i mean i don't think you probably ever played but there's this uh, ps1 square game called xeno gears that's like to me the pinnacle of video game storytelling it's definitely no, like my favorite favorite soundtrack by far the best story of any game i've ever played i mean it's kind of i don't know if you'd call it like a cult classic at this point i guess it is i mean i think it's a little bit more than that because it was pretty popular when it came out but i think at this point it, people really are, feel pretty culty about it and the people that love it are really passionate and it hasn't ever it been out. yeah i mean it'll be a challenge i think it's a challenge for like a modern gamer to look at i mean it's yeah um, it's it's weird with mechanics you're like wait <laughs> Hold on. yeah and it's it's i do think it's a fun game it's not the most fun game you know mm-hmm. i mean it's like but the graphics are, are really ambitious i mean it's like really beautiful 2d sprites in like a 3d modeled world that's fully mm-hmm. rotatable and i think that there's something really cool about that i mean like any sort of like jrpg turn-based it's like the battles are like repetitive and um you know it can be frustrating I and mean, people definitely right. like have issues with that game and i think it's fair but i do think that the story that game tells which takes place over no joke like ten thousand plus years is pretty incredible i can't think of a Damn. lot of other like stories that lasted that long that sort of like told uh, a multi i mean it's beyond multi-generational like multi-epoch storyline really cool it i do is have a PlayStation very cool one and i have some japanese games for it so i might have to i might have to check that yeah, out yeah i mean it runs really well in the raspberry pi if you uh yeah? if you set it up on there it does yeah i've been cool, playing cool. it on there so it actually works really well on there i think i'll check that out 
Yeah. All right, I know you got to go soon, but I did want to ask. Um, I was curious about your vinyl collecting because I was on your Twitter. Oh yeah. And I saw that you mentioned oh, nice. it a few times, and I I'm in the same boat, so I'm curious how how serious you take it. And I saw you mentioned Discogs, which is oh yeah, just I love my Discogs. favorite place. So what kind of, yeah, what kind of stuff do you shop- collect? Yeah, I do buy on Discogs a lot. Well, I mean, I've been collecting vinyl since college. Um, I had a pretty good run when I was in college because that was like <laughs> early 2000s, and I don't feel a like good the run. prices were. <laughs> I did have a good run. I mean, I feel like I, I went to I went to school in the Bay Area, so I'd go to the original Amoeba a lot, and I bought a lot of really oh, that's great stuff so there. Cool. Yeah, but also like I mean, I you know it was like funny, like just you don't realize again, you don't know what you got till it's gone. I mean, I remember one time going to like a Goodwill and like uh, where it was, it was like a, or maybe it was like a St. Vincent de Paul, and it was in like I want to say like San Bruno or like uh, maybe Redwood. It was trying, you know, it was in Redwood City actually. It was in Redwood City, and like. I was so naive and I just went in there and like I saw some records and I got him like, hey, do you have anything in the back? I just didn't even know that that's something to do. But I asked, do you have anything more in the back? Or if the guy might have even offered me, like, oh, we just got some more in the back. And I went through these two cardboard boxes and just all just like mint condition. You know, like I bought all this 80s. Stuff. I think I bought like every Elvis Costello record that day and like a <laughs> bunch of ELO records and like just a bunch of like good 80s stuff. I mean, I just really, I'm cheap trick. I just cleaned up on like good solid <laughs> 70s, 80s stuff. 50 cents a pop, you know. I mean, wow. it was just like the words out on that now. I mean, but that said, like you can still find some good stuff at thrift stores if you, if you stick with it. It's I mean, tough, I found some, man. I've had some. Uh, I've had some amazing finds. Are you uh, on Reddit? But yeah, I am on Reddit. I follow a like, I think it's like a thrift store hauls, like specifically for people who find vinyl at thrift stores. Oh, and it, yeah, I just see yeah, I do that on stuff. Facebook. Like people would just yeah, find, like mint Zeppelin albums and just tons of like old great things, and I just never find anything at my Goodwills. <laughs> I just don't. We yeah, well, Goodwill is like, I think Goodwill's the worst for record shopping. <laughs> I really do. I mean, I think like really any other thrift store is better for looking for vinyl. <laughs> um, but I mean, no, I'm, I'm part of like a Facebook group that does the same thing. And like, gotcha. it's funny because like now at this point, all I can think about when I see a big vinyl haul is that somebody died, you know, somebody lonely yeah, died. That's and, what I and always that's, see. It's sad. I mean, it, it's, it's it is what it is. I mean, but it keeps going at least, at least the music. It keeps going. I mean, it doesn't make me somewhere. happy. I just think it's a funny thing to bring up because everyone's so gleeful about it. I'm like, somebody yeah, obviously died and their stuff ended, <laughs> you know, it's just like, especially when it's so specific. Like somebody posted something the other day in my thrift group where it was like, they found all these like, just like factory records, UK stuff, like really like rare, like stuff that just like nobody would just, just have like, and it was right. so like cared for. And you're like, this is obviously such like a special collection, but, um, no, so I like thrifting. I've got a couple record stores in LA I like to go to. I do like Discogs, although it's like really easy to get like kind of hooked on Discogs. I know it's like oh my god, this thing yeah. when you're like on Discogs, you're sort of like I don't mean you're playing with imaginary money, but like you know what I mean when you do like <laughs> a, a transaction that doesn't even involve like getting your credit card out, it right. can be like really you're just like ooh easy. Um, and I do like on Discogs where you like find a record you like, and then you like the seller has like maybe anywhere between like 50 and a thousand records and you can kind of like page you do like the page 250 thing so you can send you just go through and you like think that you're really like pulling one over on the world by combining shipping on like four (laughs) other records you want but it's fun you know it's sort of like virtual like crate digging and i like that i mean like my newest like obsession is like um city pop like japanese like city pop records so that's just like you know, like the Japanese, like fusion new wave pop between like 75 and 85. And I'm just like trying to collect a lot of that. And that's like really difficult. Although a lot of it's getting reissued right now, but like, I don't know. I don't like to buy records off discogs from other countries because it's just, it's shipping is so insane. It's really hard to like, it's really hard to like excuse that. It's hard to be like that. I'm okay with like paying like $40 shipping. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and it's going to take like maybe three weeks to get here, but I've still found, I mean, there is like a shop in New York that's now selling a lot of Japanese records domestically and that's cool. So I buy from them sometimes. There's been a couple pop-ups with Japanese records. So that's been like a passion of mine lately. I really enjoy collecting um, anything from like 70s or 80s, not anything, but quite a bit of 70s and 80s Japanese records. Um, Where, but what's funny is like, what's, at? where's like, my collection? Like number wise. 
Oh, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea what the collection's at. I, I don't <laughs> count. But um, the one exciting thing I did do last year is I, I moved from like an alphabetical organization system to a like genre. I mean, it's still alphabetical, but within genre. And I think I've got 18 genres now. And that's oh. pretty cool. I like that. That that like, I don't know, that made me happier. It made me sort of enjoy my collection more. Huh. Um, I don't know. I feel like alphabetical just like started to bum me out that like certain things are sort of like hidden, you know, like I have a lot of yeah. Genesis records. Like I really do. I have almost every Genesis record. So like anything <laughs> next to, it's funny that anything on either side of that, like F or H sort of, it's weird. Like visually it gets washed out by the fact that like, I get just, that. you know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a couple, there's like a couple, there's almost like a foot of Genesis records. And then maybe there's like <laughs> one harmon. Then literally there's like one harmonia album on the right. End. And it's just like, it's not that I forget. It's weird. It's like, I have a, I, I mean, I'll tell you this. I have enough records that I can forget which ones I have, you know? So I feel like I need to organize them in a way that, like, I can easily... I also, like, want to organize them into groups. You're like, oh, I'm feeling like listening to a lot of, like, power pop today. So, like, I can kind of, like, peruse through my power pop yeah, section. that seems kind of, like, or, more like, I, active. That just makes more sense to me than, like, housing things alphabetically. You just end up with, like, really weird combinations where it's like, mm-hmm. huh, like putting this record back i'm not like reminded of anything next to it necessarily that i now want to listen yeah, to next yeah. you know so for me it's just all about making the record collection like really like interactive in a fun way and, yeah like, yeah listenable and also like good for guests i mean one of my like greatest thrills is like if a guest comes over and interacts with my collection i actually kind of like feel bad because sometimes like pressure people i'm just like please <laughs> like interact with like because that's what i would do if i go to someone's house and they have like a record collection i just like instantly want to like look through the whole thing right, and not amazing. on like a judgment level i just want to like look through it see what they have like connect over things that like maybe we both have or like mm-hmm. a record that the, you always end up finding some random thing You're like i didn't know anyone else had this and like you have it and like let's talk about it or like wow yeah. i can't believe you have this one record that i've always wanted but never been able to afford or you know, never found in the wild. And they're like, oh yeah, I bought that in like 95 and it's like so exciting. So I like having interactions like that with other, with a, or even just like, you don't even need to be a record collector. I just like somebody to like interact with the collection and see what they like. Cause I mean, a lot of people who don't collect records, which is most people, their main like source of music is like Spotify or Apple music, which like I do uh-huh. use Apple music, but I do think that it like creates like a strange relationship with music. Cause it's like, it's sort of like the Netflix problem where it's just like, if you can watch like anything in the world, like how will you decide what to watch? Right. And if you can listen to anything in the world, how will you ever decide what to listen to? So it's like super useful when you're like, I need to hear this song right now. Yeah. But like in terms of like actually having like a relationship with the music, I really do prefer. Um, I mean, I would say I prefer physical media, but I don't like CDs. I've never liked CDs. Oh, really? They're small. No, I mean, I have a ton of CDs. I just never liked them. I just always thought yeah. they were kind of annoying. Um, they scratch really easily, and when they scratch, it's like really unpleasant. Yeah. Um, I just feel like the jewel cases are not—they're they're inherently flawed. Like I feel like jewel cases never really come off the hinges. I think they're just like yeah. they're really like—they just like suggest cheapness. They've always felt cheap to me. They've always felt like a cheap disposable yeah. thing to me. They don't feel like they last. And like I appreciate even soft the, like, cover I mean, CDs sometimes like they get well, squished soft, really well, easily. If you don't, well, I'm sorry. Like, how stupid is a soft cover CD? You're really gonna slide the CD in and out. You're gonna slide <laughs> the CD in. Like, what do you think's gonna happen if you slide a CD against a piece of cardboard? Like, riddle me that. Like, what happens when you do that? It gets like a tiny scratch on it, and it's like ruined, and it gets like smudgy. I don't know. I just don't. I don't think they're like. I just never liked them as like a medium, even though they were incredibly useful in the '90s and early 2000s to like hear music. I mean, I'm not saying that like I wished they never existed although i kind of do because if there were no cds there'd be no there probably would be less mp3s because that was sort of the original idea yeah. to like rip yeah um you know but anyway that's another discussion but what i what i do appreciate is like i mean records are delicate too that's true uh but i do think they seem to like i don't know they just suggest a little more reverence than a cd i just never i never liked interacting with cds i never got a lot of pleasure from it yeah, I like, I like. I always like records and cassettes more. I like having CDs in my car, just like if my phone's dying or like I just mm, don't feel like going yeah. on Spotify and I just want to listen to an album. Like that's true. really nice, just to have it. That in there. is great. Yeah, and true, you like true. I learn music the best by like having a CD in my car because it's just on all the time, and so it's like yeah, I know the words yeah. now. So if I want to like yeah, learn an album, point. I'll just burn it to a CD. And put it in my car and just have it on on repeat. But but yeah, most yeah. of the time they're just a little 
And what's weird is like I have all my CDs in a big CD case in my car, so I just have like yeah. like fifty plus like empty CD cases. And it's like where where do I put those? <laughs> what are- I have that too. I still haven't figured. I put all my CDs into two giant case logics like about twenty years ago, <laughs> um, and now I don't know what to do. You know, <laughs> I don't know what to do. So yeah, yeah that's kind of where I'm at on that whole thing. But yeah, I definitely get like I don't know. First of all, like it's similar to the CD where when I'm listening to a vinyl, I don't just like put the needle on one song and then take it off. Like I listen to the whole thing, and it's just no, an exactly. experience. And you're interacting with it. Like there's there's something so special about actually like you're holding the music and you get to look at the artwork on the inside, which is always thoughtful. And sometimes you get to it read is. the lyrics because they're right there. Mm-hmm. And yeah. like you, you you have to set the record up, and it's you 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 like the manual putting the needle down like it's just a whole thing like you're interacting with it and it's like like you're in this with me a little bit and i just appreciate that it makes me it makes me like the music a lot more it makes me and like I'm the music supporting too. the artist a lot more also well like unless you, you bought it, it second hand then yeah you, which then is most of the time actually <laughs> yeah so but so we don't we records. don't need to delude ourselves but i mean it's great if you go to a show and you buy it's great if you go to a show and buy a record from the artist that's good that's like money right to them and that's a good yeah. thing to do you know for sure so i mean i I'm, i mean I'm, I'm a big fan for all those reasons i i do like the sort of i mean i will tell you i i, I should go in a sec but i should tell you this i don't know if you've ever done it turn your stereo all the way down but put your ear up to where the needle hits the record. Yes. You can hear the I mean, sometimes music, before I turn my receiver really on, mm-hmm. I get that little intimate moment where I'm like, oh my God. Like, it's yeah, actually I mean, it's just really the, making that happen. It's really there. It's really there, you know? Like, it's I've done really presentations on, like, what vinyl does and how the technology works, and I still don't really get it. <laughs> like, it still just yeah, blows my mind that it's just got these little currents inside of grooves, and when you put a diamond on it, it like, it sounds magical. It's crazy. It is. It is. It is like one of those things where it like just. I mean, it's like a CD makes way more sense in a weird way. Yeah. And I yeah. like. I like. I like that. I mean, have you ever seen anybody do like those experiments where you can like sort of like press like a very rudimentary like recording onto a piece of tin foil and then play it back? Yeah. It's. Wild. It's weird. I mean, it sounds like garbage, but the point being that like it's all just kind of like vibrations, I suppose. Yeah. You know. I guess that's. It makes really you what look at music completely different. Yeah. Yeah, I love that stuff. So I mean, that 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 feels good to me. I mean, yeah. again, like it's a fetish, and like it's certainly like a privilege <laughs> that I like have like the disposable income to like buy records because certainly like, I don't you know, just being efficient. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't at one point either, and I still did it, so <laughs> it's a thing. But you know, I mean, if I just wanted to be efficient, I would just say, oh, well, I've got Apple Music, and that's all that gives right. me all, the, and I pay whatever you know, fourteen ninety nine a month, and that gives me access to music. Um. But it's just not enough. It's not enjoyable for me yeah, to I feel that. listen that way. And I would like to sort of like put, spend my money on a way that makes me enjoy music more. Because I really was genuinely, I, I did put my records away. Like I remember after I my first kid was born, when she was about two or three years old, I feel like for whatever reason, I sold a lot of my records at that point. I kind of was just saying maybe I'm not going to be a vinyl collector anymore. And I remember oh, like... No. We moved to our new house and I put, I had them all in the basement. I didn't even set them up. And then one day I remember I like went down to the basement, looked through the boxes, like, oh my God, my collection's incredible. Not incredible. I didn't mean to like brag. I was just like, forgot what I had. I'm like, wow, there's like really great stuff in here. That'd be so fun to listen to. I set up my turntable again and I just realized I was like so much happier. And I think to me, like, I don't know, I've realized like in the last couple of years that every time I remove a functionality from my phone, I get a lot happier. You know, I used to like listen to all my music on my phone and read a lot on my phone and play mobile games on my phone. And when I sort of like set up my Raspberry Pi and was like, okay, you know what? Like you don't need to game on your phone. You can just go put the phone down, go over to the couch. And it's just a subtle thing. But the same thing is just like, just remove, like the phone is so convenient. You have like the entire universe in your pocket, it feels like. But there is sort of like a sadness to it. Like, yeah, it's like, where do you go? I don't know. I don't know. You go out of the phone. And I mean, recently I've been like not, I've been taking notes longhand on paper instead of on my phone. And that's given me a lot of happiness too. So yeah, I don't know. I'm just finding there's a lot of happiness to sort of like, I mean, I, this is like simple to say, and I love my phone. I mean, I don't, I don't want to like get like a flip phone. I, I do appreciate the convenience of a smartphone, but there's certain things that I just find that like the draw of the phone is there. Cause it's so convenient and so easy yet like it kind of destroys my um my appreciation of that thing and with music sure. and video games it definitely like sucked up all the air in my music and video game world and it didn't come back till i like 
made a decision to be like, oh, like I'm going, there's like a better world for me out there. I think what it is, the <laughs> suck is that like, oh, it's so easy. You can just like listen to a song and then not listen to a song. You can like play a mobile game. You can play like Zookeeper for like five minutes, you know? But it's like, mm-hmm. then what ends up happening is you listen to a whole, like you listen to an hour of music on your phone or you play like some game on your phone for an hour and you're sort of like, I feel empty. And like, I could have like spent the last hour like playing a like an actual, I mean, let's say they're not actual video games, but like sitting at a console and like really appreciating a video game. Or I could have yeah. spent the last hour listening to like a couple of records, you know, and like sitting, you know what I mean? And not staring at for my sure. phone. And it's like, that's something to be appreciated. I just, I definitely appreciate those moments more and sort of deciding that like the cost of like getting up and sort of setting that up is actually really worth it as opposed Absolutely. to just trying to like get it in quick on the phone. So that's my advice to everybody. <laughs> don't use your phone for so much stuff. Just try to like use other things if you can. You might you might be happier or not. And meditate. Um, and meditate. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm sure you got to go. I don't want to keep you. I should. I should. It was man. Lovely it's talking been really, to you. Yeah, it's been super. I want to talk again because to I still have a lot of questions. So it'd be great sure, to chat yeah, down the road.